go by the nick uh, purple plague uh, on been on for quite some time uh, I'm currently contracted with uh, Texas Instruments uh, on the Panda Board projects as well as some of the other OMAP4 and OMAP5 special projects. I'm partners in a small company called Tin Can Tools. We manufacture a lot of accessories for uh, uh, boards as well as uh, diagnostics tools. Like I said, this is going to be on board bring up uh, with emphasis on LCD and display interfaces. Uh, this is a continuation of uh, several presentations that I've done on uh, board bring up. Uh, the videos and slides for the previous ones are available on the uh, Free Electrons website. What we want to do is talk about uh, some of the challenges of doing an LCD bring up. Uh, it's very unique. Uh, it's something that uh, everybody usually has to deal with. So we want to look at some of the challenges. We want to look at interface timings. Uh, the details of the timings are very important. Lots of times without uh, correct timings, you get absolutely nothing on the screen. We talk about some of the other display interfaces and do some uh, basic information on debugging new designs. One of the basic things that every computer has is some sort of user display. Now, most of us uh, are used to LCD displays on smartphones and things like that, but if you go back in time, one of the simplest uh, display interfaces available is either a light bulb or a LED. Now, as a display interface, this is very, very easy to debug. It's easy to visualize the signals because it's either on or off. It's easy to measure with the multimeter. You can put the probes on there and easily see whether it's on or off. And it's easy to program. It's a single bit or a GPIO or register interface, so it's easy to program. As the computer systems, of course, have gotten more complex, they've added on more and more display interfaces. Seven segment display is uh, one of the most popular, and even today, if you look at an Arduino and AVR, it's a common project to add a seven segment display. This adds more clocking, multiple signals that you have to deal with, and uh, generally introduces very rudimentary controllers designed specifically for driving this display. Today, we've all transitioned to using LCD in one form or another. This has much higher clock frequencies in the megahertz range and sometimes in the hundreds of megahertz range. There's much more signals, sometimes as many as 50 signals that can be driven for an LCD and much more complex controllers. Uh, for instance, on the OMAP 4430, there's an entire megabyte of memory mapped specifically for controller features. One of the things that we're going to look at is TFT parallel interface. And we're going to look at this mainly because virtually everything for the last 10 years has had some style of TFT or STN parallel interface. Generally, it's going to be made up of uh, the signals that you see here, a pixel clock that's actually a clock signal generating one uh, pixel or clocking in one pixel each time. You have a horizontal sync. This syn synchronizes one line of data or one line of uh, pixels on your display. A vertical sync, that's for one uh, frame or complete frame on the LCD. And a data enable line. The data enable basically uh, indicates when uh, the data is actually good in the signals. And of course, the actual data lines, uh, you'll have your red, green, blue, often referred to as just a D line or a D uh, with a number value indicating it. So lots of times you won't actually see it indicated as either a red, green, or blue. It'll be generically marked as a D. For the pixel clock, which is pretty important as it's the core portion of clocking in all the data, and uh, what we're looking at is for each pixel uh, clock, you have a time window when the data is valid. And that data is captured 
and synced into the LCD. Now, I'm going to go through several different waveform items here, and uh, the importance of this is to be able to visualize what's going on in the device itself. LCDs can be very difficult to be brought up because you can't really look at these signals very easily. And so understanding the waveforms while you're writing the code and debugging this are, is very important. Looking at the pixel clock, we can actually make an estimate of uh, what kind of pixel clock frequency that we're looking at. You can multiply the width times the height of your LCD panel and get a general idea. If we take an example of a 640 by 480, we're talking about uh, 307,200 clocks to do one frame of data. If we want to refresh the screen at 60 times per second or 60 hertz, that basically comes out to an estimated pixel clock of 18.432 megahertz. So already there, we've gotten into a point where most tools that you can buy inexpensively are not going to be in the range that you want to work with. Most oscilloscopes that you buy uh, looking at uh, on online uh, cost-wise are going to be limited either 10 or 20 megahertz. Next step up, go into a 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz scope to look at these signals increases the cost exponentially. Now, what happens if your SOC, your um, processor, can't generate a pixel clock of that exact frequency? That's a good question, and we're going to come back to it, but I wanted to point it out at this stage. So keep that in mind. For each line that we're going to put data into the LCD, we'll use the horizontal sync and the data enable. This is a waveform timing. Again, we can see the pixel clock and the RGB data for each pixel, but we also have a horizontal sync that indicates the beginning of each frame or each line of data. And also we see an enable line that indicates when the RGB data is valid. And it is lined up with the beginning and the end of each line. For each frame, we have a vertical sync. Now the vertical sync also has a marker to begin each frame that occurs, and it is lined up with the horizontal data that goes across. Now, this section that I'm going to talk about, uh, the front porch, back porch, and sync width, are one of the most common items that people have a lot of trouble with in understanding. Remember the, the question about the exact pixel clock? Let's say, for instance, you've uh, got a device running at 206 megahertz and you divide it out for your uh, pixel clock and it comes to close to like 18.5 or 18.6. You will actually have a lot of extra clocks left over after that sequence. The front porch, back porch, and sync width are designed to help you get rid of those extras that are left over. Now, this diagram here, wave diagram, is probably one of the most complicated items for a developer to sit down, look at, and apply to their LCD panel. Now, I don't expect everybody to walk out of here having a 100% firm grasp on, on everything. The, the idea here is to basically show you some basic ideas, expose you to the information that's in here, and so that you can go back and look at it. Now, top again we have our pixel clock, we have our horizontal sync, our data enable, and our valid data. But if you'll notice there are a number of pixel clocks between the horizontal sync and the enable line. These are basically uh, dead uh, space where the system ignores these. There's no valid data. So if you have more pixel clocks set up, Say, for instance, in this example, you had it set for 18.5 megahertz, and you were only using 18.43, you would use your front porch and back porch 
to eat up those extra cycles so that they're not affecting your data and you get a perfect 60 hertz refresh rate. You have a front porch and back porch on each of the horizontal and on the vertical sections that can be set up and used to eat extra space. Also within the timing, you'll notice that the horizontal sink actually has multiple pixel, or pixel clocks for, to set for the entire width. This also can be used to, to get rid of extra signals, uh, extra time. Uh, this, in this case, we're actually using it for uh, three pixel clocks, and whereas we could actually use it one or all the way up to the top. Isn't there a mistake there in the diagram? The horizontal line shouldn't include the second synchronization Wh Which one are you referring to? Top one. At the end, yeah. It should end. The line should end at the beginning of the synchronization. Yeah. Start of the next line. This is the start of the next line. Yeah, so it should end this one line TH. Ah, yeah, sure. It right. should stop together with the front That's right. Just like you know. Yeah. It stops the front there. Right. Yeah. The end of an arrow for one frame or one line should be in line with the front wall. Yes, that's correct. There is mistake that. So, good catch. <laughs> I didn't catch that on here. Most of the values that we're going to talk about for the front porch and uh, the uh, system are all available in most uh, LCD data sheets, but lots of times they don't actually spell it out. So you may have to make calculations on your, on your particular board for this design. All of this information for the calculated on the front porch, back porch, uh, sink widths, uh, the overall design of the pixel clocks and things like that, that's a lot of numbers to keep up with for each display. Hard coding them inside Linux is not a good idea. So every time you're going to use that specific panel, you have to have that clock timing. And uh, so there'll be an answer to that here in just a second. Now, I just went over showing you the basics of TFT parallel interfaces, and it has a lot of disadvantages the way it works. There's a large number of signals. Depending on the type of display that you use, you could be using up to 50 signals working with that display. It's also limited on the length of the wires and signals that you can use. It needs to be relatively close to your processor. And it is lack of standardization on a lot of the uh, uh, voltage levels and interface connections that can create a lot of problems. That's where differential signals come in play. They have reduced number of signals. They can go much longer distances. And there's uh, generally uh, a good standardization of voltage levels. Some of the common uh, differential interfaces that you're going to run across are LVDS, DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort. LVDS generally is uh, at this stage on tons of devices such as netbooks, uh, a lot of tablets use them. Uh, it's a very good uh, display uh, interface because of the low number of signals that go through, for instance, the hinge of your netbook or laptop. DVI has been around for years as far as on desktops and connections with lots of displays. HDMI and DisplayPort have slowly be become uh, more of a standard uh, in the desktop and uh, media environments lately and will continue to do so. Now, why did I just go over TFT parallel display interfaces when I just said that differential interfaces have so much more advantages? Most of the differential interfaces that you'll run across actually use TFT parallel interface signal timing in order to generate the signals. What I have here is a listing or a block diagram of an interface for a TI chip that'll do LVDS interface. And if you'll notice on the on the CPU side here, we actually have the same signals we just discussed: the H sync, V sync, enable, your pixel clock all of your color signals. They basically go out and convert them. It's basically a bridge chip in all, all practicality. And it will convert those, all of those signals that we just discussed into four 
pairs that can be easily run larger distances with only four pairs of wires. Now this is the same that applies to HDMI, DisplayPort, and DVI. Generally these chips that uh, uh, come in pairs so that you can uh, design boards and uh, interfaces on your system. Uh, for instance, for the LVDS we have the uh, uh, 83B which is the transmitter and the 82 which is a receiver for LVDS. And these are highly used in lots and lots of devices. On the D uh, DVI side, the TFP410 is a DVI transmitter and the TFP401 is a receiver. Some of you may be familiar with the TFP410 because it's actually the DVI interface used on the BeagleBoard and BeagleBoard XM. Combination of the interfaces, a lot of these uh, differential signals actually are used in multiple configurations. Most everyone probably has a DVI panel that they use with their desktop. Now, when you plug into DVI on your panel, it actually has a chip inside there that goes from DVI to LVDS. The LVDS then is actually connected to the actual panel that's inside your, your device. And that panel actually has another chip that will go from LVDS to the actual TFP, or TFT interface. So there are multiple combinations that you can use these and each has its advantages in the sections that it's being used. Uh, one of the common items that a lot of people will do if they have a broken netbook or uh, some particular device that has an LCD panel with LVDS, they'll oftentimes buy a small uh, accessory board, you can find it on eBay and several other places, that basically takes DVI and converts it to LVDS. So you can, if you got an old uh, netbook or something with a bad motherboard, you can yank the panel out and easily convert it into a, uh, a working uh, interface. Now with all of these numbers that we're dealing with, and we just said that it's not a good idea to hard code these values directly into drivers or uh, configuration files for your specific device, that's where EDID comes in. EDID stands for Extended Display Identification Data. Basically this is a listing of all the uh, timings that are specific to the particular display that you're working with. Most of the newer LVDS displays, DVI, HDMI, and uh, DisplayPort all contain uh, the capability for reading EDID. If you've ever purchased a new LCD panel, plugged it into your desktop, and it automatically pops up on the screen and tells you that uh, you've got a, got a new display and it gives you the optimal resolutions or which ones that you support, it just communicated over your cable to get to the EDID information and that's what it uses for that. EDID support is uh, slowly moving into uh, the Linux kernel very strongly and to provide more and more support for more and more panels so that uh, less and less hard coding of values and configurations in the kernel. Um, there has been a lot of uh, communication lately uh, about reducing a lot of duplicated work within the kernel, specifically with ARM, but with a lot of other things. EDID and proper implementation of EDID for your device panel helps reduce this redundancy. The EDI usually contains a wide range of information and it even has a section that you can actually program yourself with specific information. It generally includes multiple resolution configurations for the, each particular design. It includes the pixel clock frequency that's recommended, the resolution that's recommended, the color depth, front porch and back porch information like we just talked about, as well as sync width data. The EDID itself is stored in a small serial or I2C EEPROM. It's off the shelf, standard, literally a uh, hundred uh, different manufacturers of just an off-the-shelf EEPROM. It's fixed at an address of uh, hex 50, which is very common. Most of the uh, uh, small uh, five-pin EEPROMs can be used and right off the bat. So if you have a project in which your panel does not support or you have unique configurations for your panel, you can easily add an I2C EEPROM and program the data on there yourself. 
There's a user space uh, application that's available to most people uh, that you can get uh, directly online. Uh, the source code it is there, the man page is everywhere. It's called Parse EDID. It'll allow you to read EDID data that's configured on your device. If you've got the hardware configured and set up with your platform, it should go out there and read the information and give you uh, resolution information. I'd like to look at a little bit of uh, debugging information here. As we looked at some of the uh, tables there, the waveform tables, unless you actually sit down and spend some time looking and visualizing the timing of each of these waveforms, it can be very, very difficult to, to bring up a new platform with this displays. So it's very important that you have the capability of visualizing the, the actual output of the display. That includes looking at the uh, uh, pixel clock frequency, and if you're going to get some tools such as a logic analyzer, you definitely want to make sure your logic analyzer is capable of sampling at the rate that you need. Uh, really, for most applications these days, unless you're getting above uh, into the uh, 1080p uh, resolutions, uh, 100 megahertz is generally good, 200 megahertz is better. I recommend that if you're going to get a logic analyzer to help you out with this, uh, try to get something that's open source or at least open source friendly. We have an pro open source project called SIGROCK, which is designed specifically for uh, Linux support of open and open friendly logic analyzers. I also recommend the ChronoView LA8. It's an open source friendly application, uh, uh, logic analyzer, and it's less than $200, a very good investment. It's uh, good up to 100 megahertz. If you're going to start working on a new uh, LCD bring up, it's really good if you already have some sort of reference platform that you can work with. If you ha have the capability of the same platform with a different display, that's good in the aspect that you can verify certain functionality of the display controller. If you have a different platform with the same display, that gives you the capability of sampling the signals and looking at what typical values should be. If there's multiple uh, displays um, of the same type of interface, it's good that you have several different ones. Most of the netbook displays that you're looking at for the 10.1, 10.4 LVDS displays, they're all compatible on their timing, all compatible on their uh, pinouts, so it's good that you have multiple manufacturers with same or similar styles of uh, timings. That helps you to work out debugging issues. Kernel sources, you also want to make sure that you have the latest kernels that support EDID and have uh, updated configurations. Lots of times when you're doing a display bring up or getting ready to do so, you may not actually have the display that you are going to work with. Uh, due to production cycles and things like that, you may not necessarily have all your parts at one time. So if you need to start doing development and board bring up, there's a lot of ways that you can simulate your particular display. One of the best is, uh, one of my favorite, is to actually set it to a lower resolution and configuration. Uh, there are several TFT panels that actually have the resolution of 96 pixels by 96 pixels. Now, once you configure your display for something that small, the clock, pixel clock, waveforms are much easier to see and you can use it with a much smaller, less expensive equipment. And that allow you to verify that what you think you're doing in the software is actually what's occurring. You can also use the receiver or, or the transmitter chips available and you can breadboard those very, very easily. For instance, the TFP410 can be wired into your system and you can use an off-the-shelf uh, DVI display connected to your project. So for your initial bring up, you can actually use something that you bought at a department store. You can plug it in, bring it up. On the other side, you can use the receiver chip, for instance, like the uh, TI-80 uh, SN75 LVDS-82 to actually receive LVDS data. And so you can actually tie your logic analyzer to one side of that and collect the data. There are some user space things that you can do to do very quick and very productive and give you lots of information from user space, lots of items. 
One of those is a very, very simple item of catting you random to your frame buffer. It doesn't really give you any kind of uh, huge amount of information, but it does tell you several things. First of all, it does tell you that the pixel clock is in the general area that your display expects to find. It also tells you that your horizontal sync and vertical sync are, are actually happening. And it also tells you that there are some video data that's actually present on the device. Now, it also tells you in this aspect that your frame buffer is configured properly in the kernel, and it also tells you that your machine file or whatever device that you've configured is actually recognizing the driver. So this simple thing right here can tell you a huge amount of information. FB test is a small application that I've been uh, developing with uh, for quite some time. It was originally a TI uh, code base to verify with uh, some of their uh, smaller devices. And for about five years, I've been tweaking it to add uh, more and more features. Basically, uh, with FB test, it allows you to uh, run on multiple frame buffers or a single one. And it generates this uh, color bar pattern. Basically, it has uh, the red, green, blue shade patterns. It also has bars on the top and bottom, as well as left and right to indicate whether the screen is uh, shifted one way or another. Uh, it also has diagonal bars across to indicate uh, timing gaps and uh, uh, several different things here, basically all at one time. So you verify most of your operations with one command. I'm gonna show you some examples of some failures with uh, FB test. Top is the uh, base pattern that you should expect to see, and the bottom is a failure. The bottom one actually has one green data bit that's missing. At this case, it could be that the data bit uh, is either misconfigured in software. If it has a pin mux, it could be configured incorrectly. The pin could be missing or shorted actually on the hardware, or you could have the wrong one connected. So there's several different things that could occur, but it's easy to detect this failure in one spot. It's told us that it's on the green data line and it's one of the middle bits by counting. Another example is a complete missing of a color signal. In this case, that uh, all of the blue is missing. This could indicate a complete failure on one channel of your uh, device, pin muxing issues, or it could, uh, one of the most common items is each of the color signals uh, may go through a resistor bank and that resistor bank could be shorted or damaged. So you would have to go and look at that specific group of signals. Another common problem during hardware is uh, electrical engineer may go through and actually connect up the data bits incorrectly in reverse. And this is easily identifiable by doing the color bar test. If you notice that uh, the color bars in the top, uh, bottom, left, and right all look the same. You have a solid green, solid blue, solid red, solid yellow. all right. But that doesn't give you everything uh, a full picture. If you were to bring up this board and just display pure uh, RGB color, uh, then you wouldn't actually know that the data bits were actually wired in reverse. And in this case, you can see each one of the, the gradients are actually uh, incorrectly uh, mapped. And last, uh, another common uh, during a, a hardware bring up, you'll find that the engineer may have swapped uh, a color pair. What he, what he thought was red, he actually connected to blue and vice versa. So you're allowed, uh, basically FB test can give you these patterns very quickly and identify them. So to summarize, basically what I've gone over is some of the challenges that we're looking at on LCD bring up, uh, giving you an overview of some of the interface timing. And as you can see from the interface timing, it's <laughs> there's a lot to learn and a lot to go over and a lot to make sure that uh, uh, you understand when you're doing the bring ups. <coughs> Some of the display interfaces that we're looking at that uh, both the legacy stuff such as LVDS and DVI with, with some of the things that are becoming much more popular and much more demand such as HDMI and DisplayPort as well as some basic <laughs> tools to help you out with debugging. 
All the resources for this, including uh, the presentation slides and everything, will be available on Board Bring Up um, LCD. Now, just like anything else in the open source, lots of times you can find information out there where you might not think you would find it, and you find really good good uh, documents that may not necessarily be about uh, LCD bring up, but also have information on, on timing. Uh, I've collected about uh, five or six really good PDF documents, and I'll have those up there as well, uh, as well as links for FB test. Any questions? Yes, sir. I, I have not found that out myself. I've done, uh, when I started uh, preparation for this presentation, I, I actually started looking to see if I could find uh, where the names front porch and back porch actually came from. And uh, the question in my mind actually, let me uh, reverse this back up here to that. Uh, Just a moment, let me go to that uh, particular slide. <laughs> My question though is, uh, uh, that I've always asked is, the back porch is at the front of the, the frame and, uh, or, or line, and the front, uh, or front porch is at the end, so I've never gotten a satisfactory answer why that is. Yes, sir? Right. I could. I, I follow that. What are the things that's in the flat? Good question. Are there any other questions? I have a question about this video because I'm not familiar with that. Uh, yes, sir. So is that uh, interconnection which is hidden inside the uh, computer because there's no VDS for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, parts that I was uh, discussing, the um, um, go to it. The uh, for instance, there's a wide range of uh, LVDS parts that are available to you. Uh, the uh, SN75 LVDS series from TI is a matched pair. There's a transmitter and a receiver. Almost every laptop in this room, I can guarantee you, is actually using LVDS inside. It's hidden, it's not, it's not a port on the, on the case. DVI port is LVDS. This port is LVDS. I think he, he needs a physical plug. <laughs> right, it's not a physical plug per se. So you're not, you're not going to be able to go to Fry's or uh, some uh, Best Buy or something and get an LVDS port. It, it, it's generally used internally to, to a device itself. <clears throat> But LVDS itself is the naming of a, of a certain kind of electrical signal and it's available on a DVI port. The DVI Good. uses LVDS yes. signals. Correct. So your DVI port or your display port or your HDMI port is actually LVDS. There's no, there's no 24 pins for RGB signals on your, on your HDMI connector because it, has only, it is only 18 pins or so. So there are, it's a serialized signal and it's using LVDS technology. I'll, I'll add some additional resources for you to look at for LVDS on the on the e Linux page for you to look at. What about LVDS and EDIE? Intel basically has been saying for now for probably a five years that they have tried and intend to get rid of LVDS as part of their chipsets. And their intention is to slowly transition to DisplayPort for use internally to their devices for LCDs and things like that. So LVDS is more of a legacy interface uh, and embedded or E DisplayPort is really where most of the manufacturers are trying to push and move towards. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, could you repeat only? Well, 
My, my recommendation on, on bringing up embedded display port is make sure you have as many possible combinations of display devices to test with it. Uh, get uh, lots of adapters that you can find off the shelf. Make sure you have several models of displays that work well with, with known devices. Um, sadly, I would say if it works with a, uh, an Apple Macintosh uh, netbook or, and things, or devices like that, uh, most of those will work very well in generically speaking. Apple has pushed uh, DisplayPort quite heavily and um, most of the devices that uh, certify and say that we work with DisplayPort are tested with Apple products. So anything that you find that works well with an Apple product that's what you really need to uh, use as the standard for working with it. The other portion is that you really would like to, again, have some sort of logic analyzer or really good scope to, to have handy. Uh, there, there are some good references, like I said, if for SIGROC. I'm a big advocate about open tools and open devices. Um, if you have a chance that, that you do need to purchase a logic analyzer, please support some of the open source people that are doing those particular designs and add and contribute when you can. Yeah, but are there really open source uh, logic analyzers that uh, go up to uh, considerably higher frequencies like 400, 800, 1 gig? Maybe? Not at this time. But the SIGROC uh, gr groups, as well as several other groups, are actually working very strongly towards having a lot more tools that, that are industrial and commercial quality. Uh, these things take time and, of course, money. And, and uh, when you start off smaller and prove to uh, other companies that it's a viable market, they start moving towards it. Well, I think I spoke pretty fast on this, so I think we're pretty close to the time, but uh, if you have any questions? Last thing for me. Uh, what about the comparing uh, the quality that you see on the LSD? I can only see, I, I compare, uh, I see my opinion of what is better. There is there any other way to do this kind of, uh, in a more technical way? <laughs> The, the quality of it, uh, to be honest, um, that's <laughs> once it's booted up and I've got a good display, I tend to lose interest. Right. Uh, there are some more tools, but at this stage, most of those tools are not as robust on the, under Linux in order to do it. Uh, at this stage, a lot of uh, designs, for instance, like internally to TI, once once a board and display has been brought up and works properly under Linux, they generally take a third-party application and run a very series, a very complicated series of validation tests. And most of these uh, are purchased through the display uh, group. For instance, there's a display group for uh, display port uh, uh, committee for HDMI, DVI, and you'll need to purchase something from there. And generally, those can go up into the hundred thousand to hundred fifty thousand for the hard hardware and tools necessary to do those types of tests. So again, just like the open uh, logic analyzers, there's m more room for open tools to do these types of tests under Linux and get certifications. Any other questions? If I, if I start connecting a new display, I will bring up, I do everything by the book, everything you told me, but I still do. The picture is black. Where do I look first? Where do you look first? Uh, power cord? Always depends first. Did I do all right on that one? <laughs> so, at, I'm not sure how many of you know me from, from IRC, uh, just to add this caveat. I'm more of a hacker in a lot of ways for the hardware as well as the software. A lot of what I've tried to uh, give you on this type of information is stuff that's been hard won, just bringing up new boards and things like that. So if I've missed anything or you have a question, feel free to contact me here or online. Be happy to work with you and help you, give you any pointers that I can. Thank you. <laughs>